Uh, thank you, and uh, delighted to be here. Um, great to be following the first two presentations because it sets me up rather nicely, I think, to talk about some of these institutional issues that I want to try to address today. So um, let's, uh, let's just sort of first think about where we're going with the future of the Colorado. Do I, can I advance this myself? I guess. There, oops, <laughs> what did I do? There we go. Okay, so um, let me start first by acknowledging my colleague, uh, Doug Kenny, who's our senior research associate at the Natural Resources Law Center. He's the primary architect of this study that we've been doing on Colorado River governance issues. We have a project at the center called the Colorado River Governance Initiative. Um, some of what I have to say today is drawn from the work that Doug has done uh, for the center. Um, Doug gave a talk about this issue last year at the Colorado River Water Users Association uh, in Las Vegas, and a national public radio reporter uh, commented that it was the worst received speech he had ever seen. Um, I, I hope that I'm not going to outdo Doug in, in making my talk today, and I do want to say that I've been teaching water law for more than 25 years, and so I don't want to blame whatever it is I have to say on Doug. I certainly have some of my own ideas that I've brought to bear in discussing some of these issues, and I look forward to sharing them with you. And there is a report, by the way, that Doug prepared um, December of last year that's available on our website, and, and there's a link to it on the slide. Okay, so um, as I said, I'm going to build a little bit on what uh, Kevin and Eric have already said. I want to look at at basically three uh, things today. Are we running out of water? It's not my area of expertise, but I want to give you at least my own spin on where I, I think things are going. I want to talk about the law of the river, again, building on some of what Eric's already said, and talk about uh, how the law might affect the management of the water resources that we have. And then I want to look at options for addressing potential shortages or problems we may face, again, building on some of what Eric's already had to say. All right, so um, this is a slide from the report that Doug has done. I've, I've modified it slightly, but, but what I, I basically want to try to illustrate with this slide is that indeed we are, we are seeming to run out of water, at least in the sense that the supply and demand curves have crossed. Um, for many years, we worried about running out of water on the Colorado River, but there was excess uh, supply uh, you can see, though, that demand hasn't, hasn't increased dramatically, but supply, of course, um, but it's gone up steadily, and supply has been a real problem over the past uh, decade in particular. And so now that we see these two lines crossing, there is certainly cause for concern. I'm going to try to elaborate on that in the materials that follow. And um, Kevin's already talked to us about the 2011 water year. I want to just um, I don't want to just note kind of where we are with all of the great uh, flows that came out uh, this year. We certainly have seen a, a fairly substantial increase in storage, as was already suggested by Kevin in both Lake Powell and Lake Mead. I think last year Mead was around 40 percent and Powell was around 50 percent. Mead's up now up around 50 percent and Powell at 73 when I checked uh, this morning, and so. Um, certainly a, a vast improvement over where we were last year. Um, we don't know, of course, where this is going. Hopefully we'll see uh, improved uh, flows this year as well, but time will tell. Okay, so, so what's going on currently with respect to water use on the Colorado River? Again, this is from the work that, that uh, Doug has been doing on, on our project. Uh, we're sort of seeing consumptive use at a little below 15 million acre feet right now. This uh, takes into account the um, reservoir evaporation that we're seeing. And so if you, you look at the upper basin around 4.26 uh, million acre feet, the lower basin around 8.7 million acre feet, and then the 1.5 million acre feet that goes to Mexico. So we are at least within the sort of existing supply. We're not too far away from it things look okay, at least for now. But where are we going? Well, we know that climate change is the big unknown uncertainty. Um, the Bureau of Reclamation, as many of you know, completed a study, or an interim study at least, in June of this year, the water supply and demand study for the Colorado River. And 
they estimate, uh, based on their models, that there would be a 9% drop in flows in the Colorado River by 2060. If there were a 9% drop, we're looking at, according to the Bureau again, about 16 point, excuse me, 13.6 million acre feet of water rather than the current million acre feet. But importantly, they also point out the possible range between 10 and 17 million acre feet. The most likely scenario, according to the Bureau, is between 12.5 and 15 million acre feet. So there's cause for concern. There, we, things could turn out better than uh, some of the estimates right now, but the, the median uh, uh, look at this suggests that we could be facing some additional stresses on the water resources, which would force uh, some changes perhaps in the way we currently use water. The other study that's important to consider here is the one done by the Colorado River excuse me, the Colorado Water uh, Conservation Board uh, dealing with um, a, a number of issues about water availability on the Colorado, but in particular looking at crop irrigation requirements. Uh, interesting uh, data that suggests that it, as temperatures increase, the requirements for our crops uh, would, could increase by as much as 20 percent. That obviously would mean that we'd be consuming more water uh, even while we're not actually increasing production or productive use of the water supply. So these two items, they're, they're certainly not the only issues we need to deal with in terms of climate change, but they are examples of the kind of stresses that we are seeing um, and likely to see in the future on the Colorado River, and they could exacerbate the problems that we are uh, going to face. All right. So. Uh, beyond this, of course, we've not really talked today yet about some of the environmental issues. I just highlight them for you here because even as we are concerned about the availability of water supplies for consumptive uses, we know that there are a number of environmental issues that could very well influence how water supplies in the future are used. Uh, the particular issues that are likely to cause some questions or issues uh, for us involve, of course, endangered species, which we have on both the upper and lower basin, and, and work being done there to deal with some of the endangered species issues that we have. We have the adaptive management plan for managing uh, the Glen Canyon Dam and some potential releases that could be required because of that uh, plan, and obviously uh, downstream the Colorado River Delta and the water needs that exist there. We don't really know how these things are going to play out. We don't really know what the demands are. As I'll point out in a little bit, there's obviously a potential for litigation uh, here as well. Okay, so this is sort of the standard slide that I usually show to my uh, water law students about the law of the river. And, and when I'm teaching about the Colorado River, I usually spend some time on each of these. And, and this is certainly not all of the law that's associated with the river, but these are some of the main uh, legal documents, the legal principles that govern the management of the river. Uh, we've already heard some discussion of the Colorado River Compact. I want to come back to that here in a moment. Uh, the Mexican Treaty as well. And, and lots of other statutes, policies, uh, agreements that have been reached that, that taken together really deal with the management issues that we face on the river. So let me just briefly re, uh, recap some of what Eric has already covered regarding the compact. Obviously, that is the essential document uh, that we're looking at to uh, allocate the water between the two basins. And um, important to look at the, the key language from Article 3A, because I think it, it is important. Note that it suggests that each basin, the upper and the lower basin, are entitled uh, or basically getting an apportionment of the exclusive beneficial use of the full seven and a half million acre feet of the river. Um, obviously, we, the upper basin is not using anything close to that full apportionment, but that was the original design or intent, of course, uh, of the folks who came together and uh, negotiated the compact. Then Eric's mentioned already Article 3C, dealing with Mexico's share. I read this language quite clearly as suggesting if there's not enough water um, available uh, that we, we basically have to share with the lower basin. 
uh, the responsibility for providing the 1.5 million acre feet. Uh, Eric was a little more equivocal about that, but, but certainly there is at least a substantial legal argument that we have an obligation to provide half of that um, apportionment uh, in addition to the seven and a half million that we have to provide uh, to the lower basin. Then of course there's the language that Eric also mentioned about the depletion, the so-called depletion um, uh, language, whether or not uh, it is a, a delivery requirement or whether it, it should be read differently. The language of course, as Eric's already pointed out, is that we're not supposed to, the upper basin shall not deplete um, the level below 75 million acre feet over this 10 year uh, period. I'll come back to that here in a minute. And then Eric's also mentioned the language from Article 8 of the compact, which protects um, pre-1922 perfected rights. All right, so let's uh, briefly just look at the Mexican Treaty as well. Just want to point out that while we always talk about guaranteeing Mexico one and a half million acre feet, in fact, there is at least some sense that if we are in a severe drought situation or if there are problems with the irrigation system in the U.S., that um, we can basically uh, share in any uh, deficit proportionally with Mexico. This has never been tested. We don't really know how this would play out, but certainly if we get into a severe drought situation, it could be that we wouldn't have the obligation to deliver the full 1.5 million acre feet to Mexico. All right, so um, two legal issues that I want to talk about. There are lots of them here, but there are two key ones that I want to briefly uh, talk about. First, the so-called delivery obligation or the not deplete obligation and um, secondly, I want to talk about the problem with the compact itself and whether or not it's based upon a mutual mistake of fact. First, um, what does this language mean uh, the, that you have an obligation not to deplete the river, uh, the, the uh, river at least very below 75 million acre feet over 10 years? Well, um, first, it's quite clear, I think, and I think Eric uh, agreed with this, that these pre-1922 perfected rights are exempt from any requirement that the upper basin might have to deliver water. So I've estimated around 2.3, I think it was a little less than that on Eric's slide, 2.3 million acre feet or so of pre-1922 perfected water rights that presumably are exempt from any obligation to deliver or uh, not deplete. Um, but with regard to these post-1922 rights, it does seem to me that there's not really a significant difference between the obligation to deliver and the obligation not to deplete. That is, um, it, once we've satisfi satisfied our pre-1922 perfected uh, rights, um, we, by taking additional water, we would arguably be depleting the flows at least very below 75 million acre feet. Um, so there's, I think, a compelling argument that the lower basin has that we've got to meet our, our obligation, whether we call it a delivery obligation or non-depletion obligation, it is there. Um, the point here is, and the, the difficult sort of uh, situation that we find ourselves in in the upper basin, is that the upper basin could bear the brunt of any significant depletion or um, loss of water in the Colorado River system. And I want to try to show that with a couple of slides. This is a slide that I tried to put together just to try to illustrate. I don't want to be sort of held specifically to the numbers, but I think it's for illustrative purposes. You can see what happens as flows go down on the river system. And so if you just kind of get a sense for what's happening, we we each are supposed to get seven and a half million acre feet, one and a half to Mexico, but that requires 16 and a half million acre feet uh, in the river. We obviously have not been seeing those kinds of flows in recent years, and the climate change uh, scientists are suggesting that we could be seeing reduced flows even from where we are today. So if you sort of play this out, and you look at some of the lower flow scenarios, if you look at 15 million acre feet, things are pretty much as they are today. If you look at 13 and a half million acre feet, it looks like we're still okay, at least with our current consumption rates. I would point out, however, that according to the various climate studies that have been done and information that's out there now, our consumption 
of water for, for agriculture could go up dramatically because of increased evapotranspiration from the crops. And so while we, it looks like we would have 4.5 million acre feet roughly available to the upper basin, even in a 13.5 million acre foot scenario, that is not likely to be enough to satisfy even what our current needs are at, at 4.26 percent if the temperature in increases that have been predicted sort of bear out. And of course, it gets much worse from there. If we go down to 12 million acre feet or 10 and a half million acre feet, and if the upper basin is going to bear the brunt of these, we see dramatic decreases in the amount of water that's available to us. Note, by the way, at, in the last uh, set of boxes, the last row there, at 10 and a half million acre feet, I assume, even at 12 million acre feet, I assume that that might be treated as an extreme kind of drought situation under the Mexican Treaty, so that the, some proportional reduction might have to be accepted by Mexico. That could be a difficult situation. I've tried to calculate out where I think uh, this could go. Again, a minimum of 2.3 million acre feet to the lower basin, um, but in a 10.5 million acre foot scenario, that may be all that the upper basin is entitled to. So that is sort of the, the, the frightening prospect that we face if flows go dramatically lower than we are today. Right now, it looks like they probably won't get that low. At least that's the predictions that folks are making. I don't want to suggest this is likely. But certainly, um, it is something that we need to be thinking about in the event that we face a significant future uh, shortages. This um, slide here is sort of adapted from a slide that Doug Kenny prepared. And, and I, I've just kind of played with it a little bit. But it just shows graphically what the previous slide already showed. That is. If you look at the yellow line in particular, the diagonal line in the middle of the slide, that sort of suggests what could happen to upper basin flows. And, and what it shows is that the Mexican share in red doesn't really change uh, very much. It goes down a little bit to account for the drought conditions. The upper basin share arguably doesn't change uh, dramatically at all. But the brunt of this is borne by the, excuse me, the upper basin bears the brunt of it. The lower basin doesn't change much at all in the top line that's there. The other two lines I've added to this slide just to sort of show you uh, the potential problem that we face even in a sort of moderate uh, climate change scenario of maybe 13.6 million acre feet of water. Um, currently we're using about 4.3 million acre feet uh, as you saw from that earlier slide. That's the light green line in the middle of the slide. Um, but without changing our use, but just accounting for the increased consumption that could occur because of increases in temperature, our uses would go up to where the purple line are, and you can see that puts us in a much more vulnerable situation in terms of having to face some potential curtailments. OK, so I said I wanted to talk briefly about this issue of mutual mistake. Um, not something, perhaps, that is talked about much, but it is something that we ought to keep in mind as we think about trying to address the difficult issues that we could face on the Colorado River. And you should know that there is this basic legal principle in contract law that says if parties get together and they are negotiating on the basis of a mutual mistake of fact, that a court can come in and essentially reform the contract to address the fact that they were not dealing with the correct information, this mutual mistake of fact doctrine. Now, compacts are considered both laws or statutes and contracts. And so if contract principles were to apply to the Colorado River Compact, then it's not inconceivable that a court could come in and um, decide that the negotiations that the parties had over the compact were based upon a mutual mistake of fact. That is, we, the parties thought, as we all know, that there was at least 16 and a half million acre feet that could be divided up among um, particularly the upper and lower basin. Mexico's share hadn't been determined at the time of 1922, but they knew there was some obligation to Mexico. And so it was assumed there was enough to accommodate this. This was obviously a mistake based upon uh, what we know now, and it could conceivably lead to a reformation of the contract. 
And we remember that the original intent of the parties, as expressed in Article 3A of the Compact, which I showed you earlier, was essentially an equal division of the water, 7.5 million acre feet to each upper and lower basin. And so under that theory, one could at least make the argument that we ought to share equally that the contract should be reformed so that the water in the Colorado River is shared equally between the upper and lower basin based upon the water that's actually available. Now, a caution here. I don't want to suggest that this is a good idea to bring a lawsuit um, claiming mutual mistake because, first of all, you never know what the U.S. Supreme Court is likely to do, and we'd have to start probably in the U.S. Supreme Court. I think that while there is a compelling argument for a mutual mistake in, in terms of the Colorado River Compact, you cannot predict that the Supreme Court will actually reform the contract consistent with Article 3A. A, a cautionary case I would point to is the case involving the Pecos River, which was a, involved a compact between New Mexico and um, Texas. And what happened in that particular case was that the parties to the compact had decided to set up a commission to resolve any disputes that might arise between the parties. And they put a member of the state of Mexico, New Mexico on the commission and a member of the state of Texas on the commission. And there was a federal representative to the commission as well. But because of the distrust of the federal government, the federal representative was not given a vote. So when a dispute came up, guess what happened? The New Mexico person voted for their side, the Texas person voted for their side, and they couldn't resolve the dispute because there was no tie-breaking mechanism set forth in the compact. The case went to the U.S. Supreme Court, and the court was asked to sort of reform the contract to give the federal representative a vote or to somehow have a tie-breaking mechanism to resolve the issue, and the U.S. Supreme Court said no. We're not going to rewrite this compact for the parties. If the parties want us to apportion the river, we could conceivably do that if they can't break the tie, but we will not rewrite the contract for the parties in, in, when a compact is involved. And so that at least could suggest that the court will at least be reluctant to rewrite the compact even to reflect what was clearly the original intent of the parties, so I would caution you that this is by no means a silver bullet for addressing the upper basin's issues. If the court were to equitably apportion the river, so if we assume maybe the court would say, well, you know, the compact was based on a mutual mistake of fact. It obviously um, wasn't uh, assumed that there was as much water as we actually have. There's much less water, in fact, than what the parties thought. If the parties want us to equitably apportion the river, we could do that but we're not going to rewrite the compact for the parties. What would it look like? Most likely the court would apportion on the basis of historical use. That is not an exact formula. The Supreme Court again has made clear that they are not bound to historical use principles in deciding how to apportion rivers. But nonetheless, that seems to influence the court in making these kinds of decisions. You'll recall that if you look at current usage, it's about one-third upper basin, two-thirds lower basin. I don't think it would be come out necessarily that um, lopsided, but certainly there is a, at least an argument that the lower basin has that an equitable apportionment would favor uh, the lower basin in kind of a dramatic way. All right. Um, so obviously uh, lots of things to chew on here. And I just want to throw a few other issues into the mix. Again, Eric set out nicely some of the uh, options that, that exist for trying to deal with the problems that we could encounter in lower flow kinds of conditions. I want to add a few of my own thoughts about ways in which we might uh, deal with future problems on the Colorado River. I'm going to look at these five uh, different options at least briefly and, and hopefully we can have some discussion about uh, what looks most viable. Well, of course, if we do a business as usual kind of, of approach, to dealing with the Colorado River, um, I think we are likely to face some significant problems or issues. We can get along for a while. If we have a few more good water years like we've had this past year, we might get along for quite a, a while longer. But again, the climate models are not promising in terms of what we're looking at. As temperatures go up, we're going to see increased 
use even without um, increased uh, sort of allocations uh, for the water. And I think it, it seems that we could be facing shortages here in the upper basin of a million acre feet or more within 40 or 50 years. Um, that obviously would cause um, some serious problems depending on how the, the dispute was resolved, depending on how um, the allocations go. But if in fact the upper ba basin bears the brunt of the shortages, uh, it could be a serious problem for the water users here. Um, obviously, there are some other choices, and presumably we're going to be looking at lots of different options and proposals for dealing with these issues. Ad adaptation, uh, sort of a word we throw around a lot, is clearly something that we need to be thinking about. Could we, for example, get by with reduced consumption? Are there things we could do to reduce the amount of water that we're actually using without reducing the sort of productive use of the water uh, resources that we are using? In this regard, um, I want to particularly talk about irrigated agriculture for a moment. Um, obviously, a lot of the water in the Colorado River, the majority of the water used in the Colorado River Basin and the Upper Basin goes to irrigated agriculture. Indeed, that's true for the Lower Basin as well. Um, and there's a lot of nervousness, I think, in the agriculture community about water transfers and the extent to which water transfers should be uh, pursued more aggressively to resolve problems. But there are, I think, a number of innovative ideas that are coming forward to promote transfers in ways that don't necessarily harm the agricultural community. Uh, the, the Natural Resources Law Center, the center where I work, just recently completed a study on water transfers in an era of climate change, looking at some of these issues relating to reforming current law to make transfers easier while at the same time ensuring that rural interests and agricultural interests are protected in meaningful ways. There's a lot of discussion I think we still need to have about water transfers. Perhaps at another time I could come and talk about some of the water transfer ideas that we are trying to develop at the center. But the, at the core of our recommendations or ideas that we're putting forward is this idea of redefining our water rights, not just in terms of diversion amounts, but also in terms of consumptive use. Most of you know that when you go to transfer a water right, the court will look at consumptive use as sort of the rough basis upon which a transfer might go forward. But it turns out that there are still lots of obstacles, a lot of transaction costs, as an economist would say, to before that transfer can actually take place. And these transaction costs are so significant that they often discourage what otherwise would be uh, economical kinds of water transfers. The idea here is that if we defined our water rights in terms of consumptive use and we presumptively allowed the transfer of the consumptive amount, we could really free up a lot of water and make it available for transfer. There are lots of examples of this that we put in our report. I'm just going to give you one to sort of give you a feel for the kinds of things that could be uh, discussed, that could be on the table if we, if we enacted some reform like this. Uh, as you know, many crops consume more water than other crops. And so, for example, if a farmer is growing alfalfa, which consumes a lot of water, they could shift to a crop that consumes less water. If their right was defined in terms of consumptive use, based upon the high water use alfalfa, they could conceivably change to a different crop, save water, and sell the additional water based upon their consumptive use amount. They still stay in the business, but there's water available for sale. It's just one example. I, there are lots of others, as I said, but, but I think we really do need to be thinking about innovative ways to use our existing water resources more efficiently, more effectively. Some of these reforms will require legislative solutions. They're not easy to come by, but I hope we'll have a chance to discuss and think about them. Um, other sort of adaptation uh, strategies, I think, uh, that, that Eric referred to, uh, one is that we could sort of improve the management of our current system, the, the reservoirs and all that we have. Obviously, we made a start of, on that with the interim guidelines from 2007, and perhaps more could be done. We could do a better job of conserving our water resources. I, one of the things that we've suggested is that before cities are allowed to uh, transfer water, 
uh, from rural areas, they ought to at least make commitments for significant conservation of their water resources as a way to show good faith and to limit the amount of water that would have to be uh, transferred. And, and then we have the issue that came up during the questions uh, with Eric about trans-basin diversions, in particular the proposed pipeline from the Flaming Gorge, Gorge Reservoir. You know, that proposal, the Aaron Million proposal, was for 250,000 acre-feet of water. And if you just sort of look at the numbers, it doesn't look like the Colorado River Basin can afford that kind of depletion out of the system. And I think it's fair to ask whether we ought to really be promoting any additional transfers out of the basin. We ought to have some discussion about whether moving water in, out of a stressed system makes any sense. They're talking about spending, depending on who you talk to, it could be as much as $9 billion to build the pipeline from Flaming Gorge to the Front Range of Colorado. That's a lot of sunk cost, and if they build it, they're going to try to find ways to make sure that water comes, whether or not we have future stresses uh, on the system. I, I think these are questions that we really need to seriously look at. I know that the Colorado Water Conservation Board is just committed to doing a study, and I hope they'll look seriously at uh, these potential future stresses within the basin and limiting these out-of-basin diversions before they uh, exacerbate what is already a serious problem. Um, we can augment existing supplies, but I'm not sure there are great opportunities here. There may be ways to tweak existing kinds of uh, storage reservoirs. We've got, I think, enough storage in the system. It may not be exactly where we want it, but as we increase storage, of course, we're increasing a reservoir evaporation, and, and as Eric pointed out, that's potentially problematic. I wonder if the Bureau might be at least uh, still thinking about dealing with uh, groundwater issues. A number of years ago, I think it was four or five years ago, the Bureau had come out with a proposal to start managing tributary groundwater along the Colorado River system. I don't think that went anywhere. Um, and, and if they were to pursue that, it would necessarily uh, involve potential conflicts with state groundwater laws because, as you probably know, groundwater laws across the seven basin states are all over the place. And there would have to be some kind of preemption, probably of at least some state groundwater law, laws, and I think the Bureau, for that reason, is probably reluctant uh, to pursue this. But certainly, if people are taking groundwater that is tributary to the Colorado River system, some, some thinking about managing that uh, water, I think, is worth uh, talking about. All right, well, Eric's already suggested uh, that we could have litigation. That seems to be a, a, a common theme of water disputes. I don't, it seems, it strikes me that litigation is and should probably be a sort of last resort, but there are a number of issues that certainly could trigger litigation. If, for example, we got into a situation where the lower basin was demanding um, deliveries uh, at, at Lee Ferry, um, would that trigger a response from the upper basin saying, we're gonna, we wanna change the compact? I don't know, but certainly that issue uh, could be raised. I think we would all be reluctant to sort of jump in and, and just throw out the compact. We've lived with it for a long time. I think we wouldn't know what would replace it, and so that's a risky uh, proposition, but it's certainly something that one could imagine would at least be um, discussed. And of course, we've got a number of potential issues involving endangered species and environmental concerns that could trigger litigation and could further exacerbate the problems that um, already exist. I expect that these issues would be more likely to lead to some litigation and could affect all of the water uses, both in the upper and the lower basins. And then there's negotiation, um, and I think there is some promise here. I think the states and the federal government have been rightly proud of their efforts to work together and try to resolve uh, the issues that they've been confronting on Colorado River water allocations. But I think it's also fair to say that we've not yet had to face the hard choices. And those could be coming, they could be coming soon, maybe they will be down the road, but now is probably the time to start thinking about how we confront some of the hard choices uh, that might exist. Um, there are some possibilities here, obviously, I mentioned a few already, but certainly uh, talking and anticipating the kinds of problems that we could have and figuring out 
rational ways of addressing those problems uh, would, to my mind, be a good thing. All right, so let me just uh, try to close this out and hopefully we'll have a, a time for, for a few questions. Um, I think that we are potentially looking at some future problems. It may not be in the next decade, it may be three decades out or longer. We don't really know, but if the climate models are right, it suggests we're going to be facing lower flows at the same time that existing uses are going to go up just to deal with uh, things like evapotranspiration. And so that is not a formula that's likely to lead to um, a less conflict. It almost certainly will lead to more conflict and we ought to be thinking about that. Um, we know that there is this problem with the Colorado River Compact. And we all, I think, have adapted, if you will, have learned to live with the fact that it was negotiated on a mutual mistake of fact, but that is out there. And it strikes me that if the pressure becomes too great, that this issue will come to the fore, and we could be talking about uh, some significant reforms to the existing formula. Indeed, one could imagine that um, a, a, a result like we have in the upper Colorado, Colorado River Basin, a percentage sort of allocation or formula might make more sense for resolving the, these kinds of disputes. And then, um, I guess, uh, finally, uh, and what may seem obvious is that uh, time is not on our side. Uh, we, we've got some time, it seems to me, but it is always hard to have these discussions about a future with less water. Um, if we start now, perhaps we'll have a better chance of coming up with uh, some reasonable solutions. If we wait too long, when the pressure becomes uh, much more uh, difficult to, to deal with, I think it will be harder uh, for us to solve these problems. So I hope that we can all agree to engage in some uh, sh discussion about both the short and long-term potential problems that we face on the Colorado River. And I think that's all I have. Um, thanks very much. Yeah, I just want to ask one sure. question and just point out a difference in the analysis okay. that very similar uh, presentations. Uh, right. I really liked it. But initially, uh, right at the beginning right. uh, in your um, slides, you mentioned an assumption that you've ignored the lower basin tributaries yes. uh, in terms of that 8.7 million. Yeah. I spoke a little earlier and said the lower basin was using about 11 to 11 and a half million acre feet. And I just wanted to let the audience know that as a loyal upper basin soldier, right. uh, I don't ignore yeah. uh, the lower basin tributaries, yeah, well, which is one of those <laughs> really difficult yeah. issues in the litigation, yeah, but, I, but well I, done. I'm glad you pointed that out, uh, Eric. I, I, I would only say, in my defense, that I think the, the U.S. Supreme Court was pretty clear in the Arizona and California case that the, the tributaries didn't count. But, but, but you're right, we could, we could, there are arguments on the other side, and it's a fair point. I appreciate your pointing out that difference. Good. Any other questions? Yeah, I have one. Okay. Um, if the compact was to be renegotiated because of the mutual mistake of fact situation, and like uh, your chart showed it, it's a 10 and a half uh, million acre feet situation, um, there would be like nine million left to split between the upper and lower basins. And if we went back to the original intent, which was 50-50, right. that means that the lower basins would only get four <laughs> and a half, and which would mean uh, s something like four million less than they're getting now. Yeah. Do you really think that no. they would <laughs> I, I mean, but, but do that? N well, I mean, I don't think, first of all, I don't actually think that we would necessarily, even if we could negotiate this out. I don't necessarily think that the upper basin would stick to the 50-50 uh, agreement. But, you know, first of all, I think that Mexico would probably get their share reduced by almost half in that scenario. So there might be, there might be closer to um, t uh, nine and a half million acre feet to divide up. I, I could I could conceive of a 60-40 split, maybe, for example. I mean, I, as I said, I think what the upper basin states did makes a lot of sense, a percentage uh, split, because you don't know what you've got. And um, we clearly made a mistake about what we thought we had 
when the 1922 compact was negotiated. So hard, it would be very difficult, I think, to get to any number because there would be so many parties who would be affected by it and, and I know the politics of this would be very difficult. But, you know, if we faced a 10 and a half million acre foot scenario, we, we'd have to figure out some way to uh, deal with that situation. And I hope that, I hope that we're, you know, thinking about the plans now. Hopefully that scenario will never come to pass. But it'd be better to be thinking about how to deal with it now than um, having to do it when, in fact, we're facing that severe shortage. I think there's a, yeah. Yeah. I'm happy to let, defer to you, Eric, but I'll, I'll offer my two cents, too. So the, the, the question was, what should we be doing now to try to anticipate the future problems that we could face? Fair? Maybe, maybe I'll start, and Eric, you should chime in. I mean, you're closer to this than I am. Um, I, I've tried to outline a few things that I think we can do, but we really we really do need to be more creative. And I know that, that our Western water law is more or less sacrosanct, and it's, it's not going to change radically. But there really are some things we could do to free up water supplies, to address future needs, and even to thrive. There's a, there's a really interesting set of studies going on. Uh, CSU has one of them uh, going on to, to talk about timed applications of water, for example, to fields. And, and they have this idea that you can keep production levels up very high, a little bit below current production levels, um, and uh, reduce water consumption by as much as half. So, and it, it has to do with the timing of the applications and it's complicated, I don't pretend to fully understand it. But again, if, if we had some mechanism for making that additional water, that 50% that was saved, freely transferable or, or relatively freely transferable, um, we could continue to produce those crops and we could free up some water for other kinds of uses. And I, I hope that we're uh, open to some ideas for improving the way that we manage our existing water supplies under the prior appropriation system. It's always hard to talk about changing, even tweaking, our Western water law because there are winners and losers, I suppose, at least perceived winners and losers in that process. But I think we're all going to be losers if we don't start looking pretty aggressively at some possible solutions to this problem. Eric, do you have a thought? Yeah. I, I, uh, Eric, so Eric mentions conservation. I, as I said, I, I really think that we ought to be talking with the cities about meeting pretty strict conservation requirements before they ask for more water. And, you know, I know some of our Front Range communities claim that they're doing a good job of it. I think they can do better. They have done better. I mean, it's interesting to me that the city of Denver um, and the Denver Water Board's proposal, they actually conserved more water during the drought period of, of I think, 2002 than they're proposing to conserve as a condition for expanding the gross reservoir. And, you know, fair to ask, shouldn't we demand a little bit more and try to preserve some of the water. Thank you for your presentation today. Um, I, I'd like to ask a kind of broader question. We're absorbing all the facts in the baseline. We, our historical data, our current situation, very well known. Yet uh, to assess risk and to get the public to understand the risk, it's all depending on these climate change modeling. And okay. we're in the middle of kind of a national movement to deny climate change any way, shape, or form uh, that seems to at least capture the, the popular media uh, and the public. Should the water community take a greater role in expressing concern for climate change, being involved in the climate change dialogue, or expressing the costs that are involved with p potential climate change? Yeah, I, and so great question. Um, and, you know, what your question really suggests is that 
we who are involved in, in talking about improving water management have to sort of, uh, sort of deal with risks. We don't know the future. We, don't, we can argue about whether climate change is in fact upon us or whether it's going to exacerbate our water conditions. You know, and whether climate change is occurring or not, we really don't know what it means in terms of uh, future water supplies. And so uh, there is a lot of uncertainty whether you believe in climate change or not. We know there's uncertainty. And yet we also know, and any of you who have been dealing with water resource issues for, for years know this uh, surely, that there are risks. There are serious risks, and we could uh, run into problems with the water supply. And so it just makes sense when we know that there are significant risks out there, whatever the cause, to be planning for them now so that we have viable, rational solutions that we all can live with. And, you know, I think, I think we can do that. I think there are solutions out there, but it, it's going to require some hard choices. I don't want to sugarcoat this. It's not going to be easy to get where we, I think, may need to go. But there are certainly some viable solutions out there that would not radically change uh, the way in which we're using water today. Uh, professor? Oh. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, one of my, my colleague, Richard Lazarus, who now teaches at, at Harvard Law School, um, once said that um, predicting the outcome of Supreme Court decisions is easy. You just count votes. And what he basically meant was you get to know the judges who are on the court and you figure out what they're likely to say. Unfortunately, in this particular area, it's, because, it's very hard to count the votes. What I would say is that the court in, in water cases tends to be fairly cautious. They don't like to uh, impose, they don't really know water law obviously very well. They don't like to impose their judgments on um, states in particular. And I think they would move cautiously. Uh, I think they would probably, if, we, if the case came to them about the Colorado River Compact on a claim of mutual mistake, in fact, I could certainly see them acknowledging that there was a mutual mistake. I have very significant doubts whether they would actually reform the compact for the parties, but I do think they might say that this is not, that the parties need to think about a different agreement and if they don't do it, here's what we're going to, here's what we're going to suggest as a, a better, as an equitable kind of apportionment. That's the law. If there's, no, um, if there's no compact between the states or if there's no congressional apportionment of the river, then the court does it through this doctrine of equ equitable apportionment. And there's some law that describes how that works. But in the end of the day, it's just equitable. It's what the court feels is fair based upon past history and, um, and the, the arguments that the parties are making about the importance of the various uses. And, you know, it, it wouldn't be the end of the world, I suppose, if the court decided to divide the river equitably. But, but, there, but there's no way to predict what that would look like. And so I think all of us would be extremely nervous about having the Supreme Court do that. Yeah. Professor, um, you've given us an excellent um, presentation, as did Eric, and I appreciate it. Um, my question is, do you think that a compact that was judicially reformed based on mutual mistake <coughs> would be insulated from the congressional ratification process or would there be an opportunity for congressional yeah. uh, input? Because we all know what that would mean right. for the upper basin. Yes. So um, that's a very interesting question. You know, we, when, we, when we teach uh, allocation, interstate allocation of water, we talk about three different ways in which water can be allocated in interstate. It can be done by compact, and we usually talk about that as the preferred method because it involves agreement. Um, it can be done by the court through this doctrine of equitable apportionment, which I've mentioned, mentioned, or it can be done by the Congress. And there have only been two instances, arguably, where this has happened, and one, I don't think it really happened. It's just that the court said it did, and that involves the Colorado River, indeed the lower basin. So the Supreme Court declared in Arizona versus uh, California 
that when Congress passed the Boulder Canyon Project Act of 1928, it essentially gave to the Secretary of the Interior the power to allocate the water among the um, lower basin states, and that it did so pursuant to the formula that we all know uh, for allocating uh, their seven and a half million acre feet. And so um, that's, the, that's one example, and as I said, I don't think the, the Congress at least knew that they were doing that when they actually passed the Boulder Canyon Project Act. Um, the other example involved the Pyramid Lake and Truckee River uh, dispute that involved Indian water rights. It was a very complicated kind of situation, and I think it's a unique set of facts that is not likely to be replicated. I, as much as some members of Congress might like to impose their will on the Colorado River Basin states, I think there would be so much conflict and controversy that it would be very, very unlikely to happen. Unless, and you know, here's another option, unless the states were to come to the Congress and agree that this is how we think um, maybe we should resolve this problem and we want your imprimatur on it. That would most likely be done by a compact, by a new compact though, not probably through congressional legislation. So I, it's possible, I think it's highly unlikely. Congress doesn't like generally to get involved in water disputes among states. Thank you.